of us can be thankful for the theme of this new series that we're in. The theme throughout all of our worship uh, today is the theme of hope. And as has been mentioned, hope is the, one of the most important themes throughout the entirety of Scripture. And I have one verse of Scripture that I'm going to read here in a moment. But before I do, I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, we have voter registration out in Trinity Central. And if you, as a Christian, are not registered to vote, I want you to know it's not only your civic duty, it is your Christian duty to be involved in the process of electing our leaders that will lead our nation here in the United States. Uh, it is really a sin if you don't vote. And it's a double sin if you as a Christian don't vote your values. You don't vote, not your values, I should say, excuse me. You don't vote the values of the Bible, okay? Pastor, do you have scripture for that? I do. Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. So part of your duty as a citizen, first of heaven, but also of the United States of America, is to render to your government what is due. And what is due is your civic duty to be a part of the process of making sure that we have people holding public office that are as closely aligned as possible to what we hold near and dear to our heart concerning the values of Scripture. Did you know in the last presidential election, 40 million evangelicals, that's a a term, it's actually a biblical term, that speaks of Christians. 40 million Christians in the United States of America, those that call themselves Christians, did not vote. 12 million were not even registered to vote. So, for the next couple of weeks, we are going to have a booth out in Trinity Central, and I encourage you to register to vote. Turn to your neighbor and say, I think he's pretty passionate about that. Go ahead and just, I think he, oh, okay, all right, yeah, all right. Out of love and respect for the Holy Scriptures, please stand to your feet for the reading of God's Word. One verse of Scripture to open up the message today, Romans 15, 13. Let's read it out loud together. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the eternal Word of God, the sacred Scripture. Thank you that we're able to read, study, we're able to speak it. It's in our mouth, it's in our heart, even the Word of faith, as the Apostle Paul said. And I thank you that it is the eternal seed, the incorruptible seed of your word has now been planted in our hearts, and it will produce fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. Thank you that everyone within the sound of my voice, no matter how serious the matter may be in their life, may they be reminded through this message, from this day forward for the rest of their life, there's always hope in God. It's in the name of Jesus I pray, and everyone said, you may be seated. You know, studies have proven that people with high levels of hope throughout their lives have stronger immune systems. They have healthier habits resulting in a longer life and better relationships. It can also lead to fewer chronic health challenges. This theme, this topic, this subject of hope. Less depression, less anxiety. People with relentlessly high levels of hope are more productive at work handle stress better, possess a higher threshold for pain and adversity compared to their less hopeful peers. I would say we all need a greater level of hope in all of our lives. Someone once said that a man can live 40 days without food, can go three days without water, can go eight minutes without air, but not one second without hope. I believe the great crisis in our world and the great crisis in America today is a crisis of hope, a crisis of hope. I was uh, putting some serious thought into this next question uh, related to this series, and I thought, you know, can an atheist have hope? Uh, An atheist can have some natural hope, but ultimately, the source of your hope and the ultimate hope, what does an atheist hope for? I kind of felt bad for atheists because they don't have like an ultimate hope that they're looking towards. And here's the best that the world can offer you that are atheists. They believe in a term, maybe you've heard it, called singularity. And what is singularity? It's uh, the ultimate outcome for humanity is a transhuman, 
uh, or transcendence, some call it. It is where supercomputers and superintelligence merge with superconsciousness. I saw an article on this just this past week in the news called AI, artificial intelligence, to bring people back to life with selfies used to create 3D digital clones. That's the ultimate hope that you have for your life. When you die, people will download your image from uh, your Facebook uh, or your Instagram, and they will clone you. And if they're able to, before you die, to download your memories, your personality, and your consciousness, you will live on forever in some artificially, intelligently produced clone. No, thank you. I'm going to die, and my last breath here will be my first breath in heaven, and I'm going to live forever and ever in a place called glory. Hallelujah. That's my ultimate hope, friend, and it can be your ultimate hope. Now, what is hope? What is biblical hope? Well, biblical hope isn't just wishful thinking, you know, pie in the sky, positive thinking, one day in the sweet by and by. Hope in God isn't delusional. Hope isn't merely an assumption that positive outcomes will, are inevitable. Hope is more than how Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines hope as to expect with confidence. My friend, hope is a confident belief in God so rock solid that it leads to purposeful action. Biblical hope leads men and women to purposeful action. You know, there are many things that we owe a debt to the Jewish people for. The state that the world is in, some of the most, the greatest and glorious things that we are able to enjoy as human beings has been given to us through the Jewish people. Our faith has come to us through the nation of Israel, through the Jewish people. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus is, was a rabbi, known as the teacher, known as the rabbi. Jesus is Hebrew. His lineage can be traced all the way back to, to David, to, to Adam, both through his, his uh, stepfather Joseph and through Mary. He's as Jewish as they come. So thank God, salvation is of the Jews, as the Bible said. But I'll tell you, the Jews gave us a sense of history, an understanding of history. You see, without the Jewish people, there is no people group in the world, there is no religion in the world that gave meaning and context to history like the Jewish people. The Jewish people, they gave us a sense of purpose for living. There was a beginning, there is an ending, which will culminate, this, the culmination of this ending will be the birthing of a new eternal beginning, God's kingdom, uh, 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 heaven upon the earth. The Jewish people gave us understanding that history means something. The past means something because it points to teleos, a Greek term which means uh, a goal, a, an, an objective, a purpose, and a reason. And it's the Jewish people that have given us that. I believe it was Jonathan, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs that said, it's not history that gives rise to hope, it's hope that has given rise to history. You see, those that have made history, that have made and are making the world a better place, have always been people that have been motivated with a hope, a hope that ultimately comes from God. Now, I found what I think is the best definition of hope. It's by Samuel Rutherford. He lived in the 1600s. He was a Scottish theologian and professor. It's in a paragraph form. It's in your notes. The quote's going to come up here in a moment. But I want to challenge you. If you could find a better definition of hope, please email it to the church. I want to have it. I mean that sincerely, because I have not found a better definition of hope. And here it is from Samuel Rutherford. Our hope is not hung upon such an untwisted thread as I imagine so. It's likely. But the cable, the strong toe of our fastened anchor to the oath and promise of him who is eternal verity. Our salvation is fastened with God's own hand and with Christ's own strength to the strong stake of God's unchangeable nature. Come on, let's thank God for that kind of hope. That's the hope that we have through Christ. And we can see why hope is so important. I believe the crisis we're in is not just a COVID-19 uh, pandemic the real crisis of today, not only in our nation but in the world, listen to me, is a crisis of hope. Simply look at the state of our country. We are in a second American civil war and blood is being shed in the United States. Americans killing fellow Americans. Imagine how far we have fallen as a nation in 19 years. The, 
the uh, anniversary of 9-11, when we revered and admired our first responders, these brave men and women running in, police and, and fire and rescue, running into those burning buildings, crumbling to save lives, how we honored the flag and how we momentarily came together as a nation, one nation under God. And now we've lost that hatred towards law enforcement. Just yesterday, some crazed maniac went and attempted to assassinate two L.A. sheriff's deputies while they were in their cars. They were rushed to the hospital. Protesters were outside the hospital trying to prevent the ambulance from uh, uh, bringing those, uh, those two deputies uh, into the emergency room. And the protesters are outside the hospital right now chanting, we hope they die, we hope they die. How we have fallen as a nation because we have lost our sense of identity. We are no longer one nation under God. We are a divided nation without God, and that's why we see chaos in the streets of America. As Henry David Thoreau said, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Like others before it, our most recent social disorder has been intensified by issues of race. But in the long run, friend, the underlying cause of the civic breakdown and disorder go far beyond the proximate reactions of the incompetent police killing of George Floyd. It has revealed what has been seething within this nation, a nation that has forgotten God, a nation that has forgotten its roots, a nation that has eliminated God from the equation. We are no longer one nation under God, so we become that divided nation without God. The book of Psalms said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And now we are seeing the effects of saying, God, no thank you. God, we don't need you. God, we want to remove every vestige of every semblance of our Christian faith from the founding fathers till now. We want nothing to do with that. And nature abhors a vacuum. But the crisis that we're in is a crisis of hope. You see, when a person of faith loses something, they still have hope in God. When a person of faith, God forbid, goes through a divorce or the death of a child, God forbid, or the death of a loved one. It hurts. It hurts really bad. But they still have hope in God. When you lose your health, or you lose your business, or you're unemployed, as 40% of, of um, hourly workers were laid off during this pandemic, but there's great economic news just the past, past month of August and how half of the jobs that were lost have already been recovered. We're trending in the right way, and we need to thank God for His grace and favor that can be continued to be poured out upon our nation. But if you lose your job or you lose your marriage or you lose your health or you have the worst possible thing that could happen to you, you've not lost your hope in God, and you know that God is always there for you, and He is the source of your hope. But when you have no hope in God, when you have no faith, and you lose your job, or you lose your health, or you lose something in your life, there's a void there, and it can turn to anger, and it can turn to hostility. Psalm 118, verse 8. Let's read this verse out loud together. It is better to have faith in the Lord than to put one's hope in man. You see, ultimately, your faith is in yourself, or your faith is in man, or your faith is in government, or your faith is in a politician, or, or your faith is in God. Man will let you down. Politicians will let you down. Governments will let you down. But God is faithful. He will never <laughs> let you down. There's a guy in the Old Testament who's known as the prophet of hope. Who do you think of all the great prophets in the Old Testament, which one do you think was, is known as the prophet of hope? If you pick Jeremiah, you pick the right one. Jeremiah wrote and gave one of the greatest sermons on hope at one of the most difficult times in the history of God's people when they were besieged by the Babylonians, when they were about to be conquered by the Babylonians, the walls were going to be bro broken down, uh, the temple was going to be burnt, and they were, going to be, they were going to be taken captive to a foreign pagan land, and they were going to stay there for 70 years. Those were serious times. But then Jeremiah gives a message of hope. In the worst of times, they can become and lead to the best of times. And there's that famous verse that most of us know by heart that is right smack dab in the middle of Jeremiah's book. 
Jeremiah 29, 11. Let's read this verse out loud together. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and to give you what? A future and a hope. Not just a future, but a future with a hope. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have a future and a hope. Go on, tell them, you have a future and a hope. If you're more comfortable, put your mask on while you do it. I'm good with that. You have a future and a hope. What if every young person riding in the streets of America today believed that verse? What if every one of those young people hid that verse in their heart, believed it firmly, God loves me, God's thinking of me, God has a plan for me. It's not a plan for evil, it's not a plan for disaster. I've got a future and I've got a hope. I'll tell you what, they wouldn't be burning the flag right now. They wouldn't be attacking federal buildings right now. They wouldn't be tearing down statues right now. The crisis of hope. Jeremiah had a difficult assignment he, he was preaching to God's people when they were not in the mood to hear preaching. <laughs> he, was, he was prophesying what God was about to do, and they were not receptive of it. He was telling them, the Babylonians are coming. Before the, the, the dust clouds of the footmen of the soldiers of the Babylonians were ever kicking up dust around the, the city of Jerusalem, they said, it's not going to happen. And then it happened. And while he was saying they're coming, the false prophets were saying they're not coming. He was labeled as being unpatriotic because he was, he was preaching a message that Jerusalem will be conquered. And they didn't like that message. They wanted him to preach smooth things, good things, tell us nice things, Jeremiah. He was persecuted. He was almost killed. He was thrown in prison into a dungeon, into a hole, a, a mud pit because of the message. Finally, he got to a place, I'm done, God. I, 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 I turn in my resignation. I don't want to preach anymore. And I thought of quitting, he said, but then his word was like a fire shut up within my bones, and I was weary of keeping it in, and indeed I could no longer keep it in, and he had to continue to preach the message. Thank God for Jeremiah, a prophet of hope, in the midst of a serious matter, in the, in the midst of a serious situation, said there's still hope in God. And what was Jeremiah's message of hope? It was four things for us today that we're going to look at, four things. Number one, Jeremiah, his message of hope consisted of, first of all, there can be no substitute for real hope. There's a lot of false hope in our world. Friend, you don't want to be caught up in the false hope. You want the real hope. Look at Jeremiah 29, verses 8 and 9. It says, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners, diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. You know, there are lying prophets today, just like there were lying prophets there. There are false teachers today, just like there were false teachers in the time of Christ and the time of the apostles. You and I must believe what God has already said to us in the Scriptures. This is our ultimate source of hope and guidance, what God's Word says. Thank God we have the Bible. So the false prophets, while Jeremiah was saying the Babylonians are coming, the false prophets were saying, no, they're not. Then they arrived, and the false prophets said they're not going to stay, and <laughs> Jeremiah said they're going to stay. And then when they finally broke through the wall and conquered the city, the false prophet said, well, you're not going to be in Babylon long, and Jeremiah had to say, yes, you're going to be there for 70 years. Wow. False hope. Don't buy into the false hope being preached by many today. You know, there's the false hope of someone's sickness. Have you ever heard of the someone sickness? You say, Carl, what's the someone sickness? Uh, the someone sickness is, if I could just have married someone else, I'd be happy. Yeah, right. <laughs> if I could just be with someone else, I would be happier. Yeah, right. It's someone sickness. And then there's the false hope of destination sickness. Have you ever heard of destination sickness? Destination sickness is, if I could just move out of Lubbock, I would be happy. Where do you want to go, Austin, Houston, <laughs> Dallas? I thank God I'm in love. You want to go to Albuquerque, right? Right? Denver, uh, what do you want to go? Seattle, I've always wanted to go to Seattle. Not anymore, right? It's destination sickness. You see, no matter where you would go, when you arrive, guess who would be there waiting for you? You. 
your unhappy, miserable self that you are. <laughs> That's why happiness is an inside job. If you're not happy here, darling, you're not going to be happy. Any, you could go to Mars. You could be selected by whoever it is trying to get people to go to Mars, and you could end up Mars. I bet I'd be happy. You're like, no, I want to go back to Earth. Too late. <laughs> if, if you're not happy with yourself, you're not going to be happy with whoever you got married to. And then there's the false hope of problem-free living. Carl, I would be happy if I didn't have so many problems. No, you would be dead, because the only people without problems are those buried six foot under, right? <laughs> problems are a proof of life. Thank God for every problem you have in your life right now. That means you're doing something right. You're headed somewhere straight and somewhere you need to be. Amen. <laughs> I love what James said. He said, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations and trials. and tri What? I mean, wh what was James on when he said that? He was on the Holy Ghost. That's what he was on. <laughs> count it all joy. The trying of your faith works patience, right? So, number one, Jeremiah's message of hope was, number one, don't buy into the false hope because there is no substitute for real hope. And real hope is from a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And without a personal committed relationship with Jesus Christ, all you have to look forward to is your selfie being cloned into a 3D digital image of you and your consciousness being downloaded in some robot for the rest of, <laughs> for the rest of eternity. No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Number two, hope makes the most of every circumstance. This is such a prophetic point to me. Hope makes the most of every circumstance. In other words, Jeremiah was saying, hey, you're going to Babylon. Kicking and screaming, you're going to go there. And you're going to be there, not for 70 weeks, not for 70 months, but for 70 years. You see, you sinned against God's Sabbath, and you didn't let the land rest for 70 Sabbaths. So for every year, you kept working the land and didn't give the land its Sabbath. You're going to spend in a foreign land 70 years. But here's his message. Make the most of that 70 years. Make the most of every circumstance. Look at Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried, not the Babylonians, I, the Lord, carried you into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's the word of the Lord. Number 5, verse 5. Build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Number 6, verse 6. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. And I want you to read this last part out loud with me. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Increase. Do not decrease. You're supposed to what? Increase, not decrease. You're going to be there for 70 years, so... How practical is the Word of God? I would have thought Jeremiah would say, while you're there, I want you to pray, I want you to fast, and I want you to study the Torah. Now, I'm sure that was part of it later on. But when you get there, and you're going to be there for 70 years, here's what I want you to do. Jeremiah's remedy for captivity, get married and have plenty of babies. That's what he said. Of all the things Jeremiah could have said to a people that have been taken from their homeland, they're slaves. They are slaves in a pagan, ungodly, foreign land called Babylon. What should we do while we're here for 70 years? Which meant those that went weren't going to ever go back home. Like if you were 30 and you're going to be there 70 years, count, you know, do the math. You're, you're, you're going to die in Babylon. A lot of times we're living and making decisions not just for us, but for our children's children. Hello? So while you're there, I don't want you to wither away and die. I want you to make the most of your captivity. How do you make the most of your captivity? Get married and have plenty of babies. Have fun while you're doing it. That was God's solution. You see, my life's not going very good right now. Get married, have plenty of babies. I'm too old for that. Uh, C.S. Lewis was 60 when he got married. 
Abraham and Sarah were 190 when they had babies. I'm just saying, miracles do happen. (laughs) Keep dreaming. Keep believing. Well, I don't want to get married. Then help others get married and have plenty of babies. Come work in the nursery. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Be around those that are getting married and having plenty of babies. You say, well, I've I've gotten married and I've already had all those babies. What's it for me? Plant a garden. (laughs) I'm not making it up. Plant a garden and then eat the fruit of that garden. Okay. In other words, what's he saying? Make the most of your circumstances. Quit cursing what happened. Quit trying to change what happened. What happened has happened. You don't want to be where you are, but you are where you are. So how can you, with God, make the best of those circumstances? Here's what Jeremiah was saying. He said, don't wage war with the heathen captors. Don't cause a lot of commotion. Play nice, buy your time, get home. I love that. Play nice while you're in Babylon. Play nice, buy your time, get home. So whatever circumstance you're in, just play nice, buy your time, and get home. We're all captives here in the United States of America, wherever you live in the nation. This is not our final resting place. We are sojourners, pilgrims. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Can I get a witness in the house of God? And we're not done yet. You thought that was a hard pill to swallow? Point number three. (laughs) People with hope prosper. People with hope what? They prosper. Look at Jeremiah 29, 7. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city in which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Are you kidding me? That's thousands of years old. If, if I would have been preaching to God's captives, I would have said, you deserve to be here, you worthless, no good sinners. I warned you for years, and you didn't listen to me, and now look at where you're at. <laughs> That's probably what I would have preached. But thank God I'm not Jeremiah, right? <laughs> no, Jeremiah's like, get married, have plenty of babies, plant a garden, make sure your, your sons get married, give your daughters in marriage, make the most of these circumstances, you know. And then he says, Pray for the prosperity of Babylon. What? People of hope are motivated, intentional, purposeful action because of their rock-solid, confident belief in God. They have this hope from God as the source of their hope. They have purposeful action to make the world a better place. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, verse 11, Scripture says, occupy until I come. Do business until I come. Stay busy until I come. You're here in the world. It's a bad place. Make it better. Hallelujah. And one of the ways you can make it better is pray to prosper. And you would think I'm some TBN prosperity gospel preacher today. (laughs) Just send your tax-deductible offering to P.O. Box 1234, Lubbock, Texas. I will send you an anointed face mask. This face mask has been in the Holy Land. I prayed over it with anointing oil. It will be yours for a small donation of $1,000. Don't laugh, it's going to be happening if it's not already happening. (laughs) Face masks from Israel. (laughs) Oh, Lord help us. Not that kind of, not that kind of prosperity. Godly prosperity. I read something once, the best way, if you want to fight poverty, the best way to fight poverty is to make sure you yourself aren't poor. You want to help poor people around the world? Stop being poor yourself. And we live in a land of opportunity. All these people complain. I'm sorry, I'm old school. I'm 57. Wah, wah, wah. Call the ambulance. Wah, 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 wah. You know, if you don't like America, go get a ticket, fly somewhere else. Take your miserable self there, why don't you? I mean, get real, right? I've traveled literally all over the world. 
I love the nations of the world. I love all the different cultures and all the different people. Literally, I have ridden a train from Madras to Hyderabad in India. I have eaten with the Indian people. I've been with the poorest of the poor in their villages, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, eating their food. I love all the nations of the world, but I want you to. I've been to Africa. I've been to Kenya. I've been to Nigeria. I've been to South America, South Africa. I've been to Cape Town. I told my wife we would move to Cape Town one day. It's so beautiful in Cape Town, but thank God for America. It is the greatest nation, and you have the greatest opportunities here. Get busy. Pray to prosper. God has a future. God has a hope, and God has a plan for everyone's life if you'll surrender to him. Wow. Someone's got to say it. God wants our country to prosper, prosper. Wherever you're living, wherever you're listening to this message right now, wherever you're at, God wants you to be part of the solution, not the problem in your country, in your nation, in your city, in your community. He wants all of us to work for the economic growth. Seek the peace and prosperity or economic growth of the city which I've carried you into exile. God wants you to prosper. He wants our country to prosper. He wants Venezuela to prosper. He wants the poorest of the poor to prosper. And if you will simply begin to apply the principles of God's Word, I guarantee you, history has proven it, that group of people, that nation, that city will begin to prosper. That's the heart of God. Pray to prosper. I want to encourage all of us to begin to pray for our country. Pray for healing, yes, but pray for prosperity. Pray for economic growth. Pray for your personal economic growth because as God blesses you, it allows you to be a blessing to others. And finally, number four, God is our source of hope. God. Once again, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Notice this. God says, I know the thoughts that I think Toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Three times. God's telling you and me in this incredible verse that's impregnated with such promise and such hope and such life. He's saying, I'm thinking about you. I've, I've got thoughts about you. Now, the devil has thoughts about you. And sometimes what the devil thinks about us, we think about ourselves. But it's not thinking the devil's thoughts of you. It's thinking God's thoughts that God thinks of you. You know, one of the silliest questions a wife could ever ask her husband is, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know why you never get a good answer to that question, ladies? Because he doesn't even know what he's thinking half the time. <laughs> His mind is like, portions of, of a man's mind is like a, a black hole filled with nebulous dust. And, and you just, you, you don't want to go down that dark hole. <laughs> but imagine God's thoughts. God has thoughts about you right here, right now. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts about your future, how bright it's going to be. Maybe not in this life. It can be, but definitely in the next life. He's thinking, hmm. During my millennial reign, I, I see you doing this, that, and the other. I'm going to put you in charge of this, that. You're going to be overseeing that. Oh, you've got a bright future. You've got a hope. Because God thinks of you. You see, God knew his thoughts toward these exiles in Babylon thousands of years ago. He wanted them to be reminded of his thoughts towards them. David in Psalm 40, King David, he said, Your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order, because there's so many. It would, it would declare, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. God's thoughts for you and me are more than can be numbered. And I love what the great golden tongue orator of London said, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He said, the Lord not only thinks of you, but towards you. There's a difference. The Lord not only thinks of you, but towards you. His thoughts are drifting your way every moment of every day. Throughout this entire service, God's thoughts have been drifting towards you. The thoughts that God thinks about you are coming our way. Capture one of those thoughts. Thoughts of love, thoughts of grace, thoughts of peace, thoughts of hope, 
thoughts of, I got an idea. It came from God if it's a good one. I got an idea how this could happen. We could change this. We could do this. Grab hold of one of those, of the thousands and thousands of thoughts of God that are coming your way. Just grab one of them and they could change your life. You know, I've done, I've done a lot of reading in, in the psychology in my certification process through my, my coaching. And I, I've read so many books on psychology, I've actually fallen in love with the, the subject, the topic of psychology. You know, like William James, the father of modern day psychology, you know, Carl Rogers, all these guys reading all their books, right? And they've proven now through empirical research that a person can change their life if they just change the way they think. It truly is, as Zig Ziglar said, we need a check up from the neck up. It's our thinking thinking that gets the worst of us each and every day. It's called cognitive therapy. And what's helping people without the drugs, what's helping people is in a, a cognitive therapy session, what's helping them is having them begin to interpret the events of their life and their own life and, and the circumstances of their life differently. Well, you know, science is just basically catching up with what the Bible says. Paul said, think on these things. Whatever is pure and just and holy and good and worthy of praise, think, meditate on these things. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We need to begin to think the thoughts of God. I want to end with one verse of Scripture and then one quote. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Let's read it out loud together. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, love. They'll always abide. We always have faith, hope, and love. And science can't define faith, hope, and love. It's outside the world of science. It's outside of a laboratory. Science can't produce it. The science of philosophy could try to define it. But faith, hope, and love only lives in the realm of it's a spiritual dimension. And it comes from God. Our faith, our hope, and this beautiful gift called love. They will survive. I don't know what's going to happen in this next election. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or next month, next year or whatever. I don't know how bad it's going to get. I don't know. It may get worse. I don't know. We may all be taken captive and, and shipped off to the Middle East somewhere. I don't know. God forbid. But here's what I do know. No matter how serious it is, with God, there's always hope. And wherever we end up, we're going to get married. We're going to have plenty of babies. We're going to grow our children. They're going to get married, and they're going to have plenty of babies. We're going to grow a garden. We're going to be at peace wherever we're at, and God's going to prosper us, and there's going to come a day when he's going to call us all home to glory, and we're going to live forever and ever in God's eternal kingdom. Hallelujah. So hope is the torch that lights the beacon of faith, and faith is is the beacon that reflects the power of God. And God is the power that creates the miracle of love. Friend, after it's all said and done, now abides faith, hope, and love. Man didn't give it to you, and man can't take it from you. It comes from the ultimate source, which is God, who is for you and not against you. And his thoughts are towards you, and they are by the tens of thousands coming your way each and every moment of every day. And they're thoughts of peace and not of evil. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just take a moment in your own heart right now. You can say it under your own breath. God, thank you for this message of hope. I hear what you are saying to me. May hope become the theme of my life. Lord, I want to be a person of hope. I want to be a dispenser of hope. I want to be a sharer of hope. Now, just under your own breath, just say, God, you are my confident hope. You're the source of my hope by the power of your Holy Spirit today. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you need to rededicate your life to Christ. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer out loud 
with the rest of us. We're all going to say this prayer with you. It's so important that you say it with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart. If you want to commit or rededicate your life to Christ, here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart, come into my life, be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family?